a whole nother layer. <laughs> Happy Thursday night, everyone. We're back Happy with Thursday, Thursday Night Live. Hello, Dan here, Penelope there. Evan Hammonds from Blood Horse. Yeah, you all are up there. Yeah. Down <laughs> below. Down below. How are you, how you doing, good. Evan? I'm doing fine. I'm down below in the basement here at uh, the home, office, <laughs> home bunker in uh, Versailles, Kentucky. It's another beautiful day in the bluegrass. Uh, it's been a little chilly the last couple of days, but it's spring has arrived, and uh, I guess you know breeding season is starting to wind down a little bit, and we're uh, excited here for some racing at Churchill. Absolutely. Are you, uh, I know they're having like a press conference, I think I saw, outside of the Barbaro statue. Are you heading to that? Uh, probably not. I mean, I, I don't think there's going to be a whole lot of great intel there, um, but we're yeah. you know, looking forward to the beat. Uh, you know, look, looking at the, just, just based on that first card, there's a whole like pent up excitement. I mean, I, I think this meet's going to be, and, and just based on, you know, the, the riders that are going to be there and talking to a couple of the trainers, this is going to be, this is, this is going to be some meat. Yeah, no, I mean, you have Monomoy Girl, like, in an allowance race, just for, well, like, just for gig. Yeah, it's like it's like uh, it's like Belmont Day in New York. She's running, she's running in the four. I it's like I, I'm so excited. I can't wait. I think they're gonna have you know, Dan. Are you gonna play a little Churchill this weekend? Am I gonna play? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'll tell you what. Speaking of that race, I was happy to see it carded as the fourth race of the day. Usually, it's the kind of race that they would you know kind of uh, stack up yeah. near the back, and and you'd have it would be part of the pick five or pick six sequence. Now that sequence is a lot is a lot beefier, um, and it's it's an awesome card. Um, since you mentioned it, a uh, couple of plays on America's Best Racing uh, Dan's double will go up tomorrow. So uh, if anybody's interested in those couple of plays, I mean, yeah. I am. Yeah, right on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They'll be up on the site tomorrow. So by the what's way, your, what's your focus track for for Dan's double? Because you have Santa Anita opening up, you have Churchill opening up, you oh, have it's Churchill. Tampa. It is Churchill. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah. A couple of races tomorrow, at Churchill or Saturday at Churchill. Losing track of days, of course. It's, yeah, no, there's there's no there's like time is an illusion in coronavirus. <laughs> it is. Uh hey Janet. Janet uh has popped in with a comment just uh, just to say hello, how you doing? And we should say, um, we haven't even done a formal introduction here. For those of you who don't know, uh Evan is the editorial director at Blood Horse, um a magazine that I I remember the first time I got my hands on one, uh I was probably in my like mid teens. And I just remember, of course, reading it front to back a hundred times, like cherishing every single article and photo. Um, and I'm sure a lot of people had that experience. Um, so Evan, it's great to have you on. D did you have that experience uh, kind of coming up or did you always sort of, uh, was that like the Holy Grail for you, the blood, uh, blood horse? Well, well, it's an interesting story. I actually started working at the blood horse when I was a senior in high school. Uh, through another friend, we were working on some kind of his, history project and uh, was told, hey, this place out of the Blood Horse, they have all kinds of horse racing photos. And I, I'd gone to the track a bunch, and, uh, I, uh, and my grandmother uh, taught me how to read the racing form. So while we were out there, you know, the, the exec, Charlie Stone, who was the executive editor at the time, uh, kind of took us a couple of kids under their, our wing and showed us around, and then just through other conversations, uh, later it's like hey would you like to uh, work here and at the time i was you know bagging groceries at the at uh grocery store in lexington i was like oh this this, this might be pretty cool so <laughs> uh so actually so i started working so i didn't have that experience of of uh you know getting the magazine but i actually had the experience of walking in the door and getting a job That's that awesome. is so cool because i like first of all charles uh meredith is on and he says he loves Blood Horse. So, hey, Charles, you're in the right place right now. We're all fans. My first memories of Blood Horse, um, my parents subscribed, and they it came to my dad's office. Mm -hmm. And when I was little, I would go over to the office and steal it and um, try to trace all the pictures because I was going to be the next Richard Stone <laughs> Reef. I just knew it. Yeah. Um, so I can only draw horses facing left to this day. <laughs> <laughs> they cannot like if a horse is facing right. I'm like I can't doodle that. But um, tragically, I never became the uh, the the artist I thought I could be when it came to drawing. But it got me really interested in photography. So I owe you know a lot of my career to the blood horse. Oh, fantastic! Well, fantastic. Well, you should have walked through uh, walked through the door when you were uh, in high school or college, and who knows what would have happened. 
<laughs> um, yeah, that was great. It was a great place. You want to hire college me? I'm just gonna. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wouldn't say I was uh, the most productive uh, you know, quote unquote, intern they had, but no, it was a great experience to work there, uh, uh, you know, full time during the summer. And then well, I, was, I went to University of Kentucky, so I was in Lexington. So worked there, you know, a couple of afternoons and, and, and obviously learned more about journalism from, from the crew there and, you know, reporting and editing and production work that I, that I learned in four years in the UK. So. It's a great mm -hmm. experience. I worked there for a couple of years, then moved on, and then came back uh, about 20 years ago as the managing editor. So I I have to ask, with this amazing history you have with Blood Horse, like, do you have a favorite moment that you can, like, or, like, you know, a top five even of just, like, things that you've experienced with Blood Horse that you're just, like, still so stoked about? Uh, well, the, the, the paycheck that comes every two weeks pretty heavy. <laughs> Fair, very fair. Uh, you know, it, it's, uh, uh, just just the whole experience, uh, mainly of uh, of going to the the Triple Crown races and, and the Breeders' Cup too. I got uh, this was a long time ago, but I got to go to the, the first Breeders' Cup uh, as part of the uh, Blood Horse uh, team, and that was fantastic. But then I, you know, left and went away and worked at the racing for other places. But I just think that that experience of going to the the Derby and and the Preakness, which is this weekend, which uh, I have a soft spot in my heart for Baltimore and, and Pimlico. Uh, I, I would say going to the Triple Crown races is just uh, really uh, you know the camaraderie amongst the riders, the horses, the owners, the whole experience is uh, a, a treat every year. And uh, missing that right now, but hopefully we'll. I have to see how that shakes out later in the year. Yeah, I, I completely agree. For me, like one of the things I also love about um, those Triple Crown races in the Breeders' Cup is if you if you're a like a, a horse racing journalist of any kind, like you know mm -hmm. writer, photographer, whatever it might be, it's kind of like horse racing summer camp where you see all your camp friends all in the same place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. that's true. Yeah, you kind of gather at the Derby and at the Breeders' Cup and. Sadly, over the last couple of years, it's it's you know seemed one or two have been missing as the you know media members kind of dwindled down a little bit. But still, it's a hardcore bunch. It's fun. It's fun. Yeah, I was going to say, t tell us more about your love for uh, Baltimore and the Preakness. Uh, this is an ongoing thing with me and Penelope. My 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 big uh, race every year is the Preakness. I, I love the Preakness. I lived in Maryland for a couple of years, and um, uh, I I was tweeting earlier today about you know thinking about going to the Preakness in two thousand four. Um, I just have all these like vivid memories of Smarty Jones and all the rest of it. Uh, what about for you? Well, uh, I really don't know. I mean, because you know, Pimlico is so different from anything in Kentucky or anywhere else for that matter. And I hadn't really spent that much time in Baltimore. But when I lived uh, later in my career, lived in New York, and we would go down, we would go to Baltimore <clears throat> for the weekend. And, and the first uh, Preakness I went to was uh, Risen Star, nineteen eighty-eight. Oh, cool. And, uh, and a friend of mine's father <clears throat> owned a horse that was on the undercard, and uh, that horse won. So we got to go to the Winter Circle on Preakness Day. We, you know, we had pockets stuffed with money. You know, after like <laughs> we all had a big day and uh, loaded up on Risen Star. So you, you kind of get attached to that. You you want you want that magic again. And every time I go back to uh, go back to uh, Pimlico, uh, you know, people complain about it. It's a dump. It is a dump. But, but it's it's a lovable dump to me. I mean, I, I love the, the mystery of the elevator, whether you're going to get... <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I love whether I'm going to get a splinter, you know, holding a guardrail. I, 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 <laughs> well, it, it's not going to be like that for long. I mean, it, it, there are uh, there are plans for, for major renovations, wow. we, we should say. So if you haven't been before, don't, don't, don't be scared. It, it's... Uh, if you haven't been before, like honestly, go when this is all over. Obviously, don't like break into Pimlico now. That's a bad idea. <laughs> but um, like it really is. Evan's correct. It is unlike any other racetrack, especially on you know the big days, the the Preakness, Black Eyed Susan Day. It is like it feels like all of Baltimore, all of like young Baltimore shows up and are there just to have a great time. And like people are. People from Maryland, Dan, are like really into Maryland. Like yeah. everyone's got like the 
flag stuff going on. I had I saw I took a picture of a woman who had Maryland State flag shoes one year, and and a, and a crab T-shirt. <laughs> do you and, know about crab fries? Uh, do I know about them? Yeah, is it just fries with crab and a ton of Old Bay? Well, no crab. I think it's just the Old Bay on okay. it. <laughs> I'm sure I've seen some version of that somewhere. Yeah, we 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 went through we go through like waves here where we just put Old Bay on everything. Cause my wife's I should also say my wife's from Maryland as well, uh, born and raised, and so um, it just you know I mean, Dan, you're really committed to Maryland, is what? Yeah, we're we're one, we're one of those households. We're we're a Maryland household. We we we, we root Maryland. So yeah, we go by the way, shakers a week a year of Old Bay. It's good yeah. stuff. <laughs> Uh, say, John Wilson is here. He says, hey, guys, multitasking, watching you and Golden Gate, which is amazing. I know, Dan, you were playing a little Golden Gate earlier on today. Yeah, I hope Travis is having better luck that, than I did with the Golden Gate uh, pick six. I played the pick six. I got knocked out. I played the pick five. I got knocked out. I played the pick four. I got knocked out. I showed restraint, though. I did not play the pick three or the late double. Um, so again, I, people dance <laughs> up on the site tomorrow with his safe betting advice. <laughs> well, at least we know that I'm due. Um, I'll, I'll make that case. I, I'm I'm due for a for a hit this weekend. But good luck, Travis. I hope you're hope you're making money. Actually, I tweeted out before we hopped on um, Charlestown open tonight as well. And I just you know I just I was like you know let me look through it real quick just the first race. And I spotted a horse who you know I, I was just pulled up the replay. I mean so I, I guess I went pretty far down this rabbit hole. Um, it was supposed to be just a quick, you know, sort of glance at the, at the PPs. I watched the horse's last couple of races and had really bad trips, stumbled out of the gate and was breaking from the rail here. So I tweeted, you may want to look at this horse 16 to one, the horse <laughs> leads from gate to about 20 yards out and gets nailed at the wire at 16 to one. Did he well, bet? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> No, <laughs> I bet I bet the horse to win in place. Two horses passed her on the outside in like the final stride. So oh, bummer, Evan. Have you been playing at home since uh, this whole lockdown started? Uh, well, not as much since the lockdown started, but uh, I had a New Year's resolution to bet more this year. <laughs> and because I mean, I'm not a huge. I mean, I, I look and, and play some, but I'm, I'm nickel and dime kind of guy. So actually, I started off the year uh, betting more and actually doing very well at Gulfstream and uh, oh. and fairgrounds, and then just kind of after things closed down, I kind of cherry picked here and there, and uh, got got completely decimated on Florida Derby Day. So kind of mm -hmm. kind of pulled pulled back the reins. <laughs> uh, What's yeah, your strategy? Uh, What's your approach? What what kind of bet bets do you make? Uh, I am a complete opposite of you, Dan. It's it's win in place pretty okay. much all. I'll play a few doubles. Uh, I, I I have a hard enough time picking a winner, much less multiple <laughs> winners, but to try to yeah. churn my way that way. But actually, uh, according to my account, I am, I'm up for the year. So Nice. Yeah. Do you want to write a column for us? Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Evan's exacta sounds sounds a lot better than Dan's double. So. Yeah. Well, we can yeah. run the alphabet. <laughs> and again, if I play a pick three... Uh, I, it, it's pretty much like a single. I mean, I, I play. Uh, I, I just don't like the spread. I don't like to lose. So I yeah, I feel the same way. I'm usually a like a first, second, or like I even do the su the ultimate suckers bet, which is the across the board bet, because yeah. I just the amount of pleasure I get from winning does not offset the like devastation I feel when I lose. I get so yeah. mad. No, so I, I bet win place pretty much. Yeah. And doubles. And do, I like doubles. So, yeah, I mean, if uh, we talk about this all the time. I mean, I, th I think if I were to, you know, if somebody was just getting into, and now we're, you know, hopefully, I mean, I think we're speaking to more people who are betting on horse racing for the first time. I, you know, I think what I tell them generally is, I mean, I, I certainly wouldn't recommend doing the pick fours, pick fives, and pick sixes. In fact, I, I remember when I first started betting, it was me and, you know, my dad. Like, it was always just, you know, pick one horse, we'll bet the horse wouldn't play a show, we'll do something simple. And then eventually you think you're smart enough to graduate to these other other bets. And and maybe you are. I mean, certainly I wasn't equipped to hit a pick five when I was, you know, 15. When I was Not that you were betting when you were 15. Right? <laughs> no, but in theory, if I was, I mean, I wouldn't have been equipped to hit a pick five. Um, but 
now I am, but it doesn't mean that I'm going to hit them with enough ra- regularity to like offset the pain that Penelope was talking about. So yeah, I, I mean, I think it is generally a good idea if you're just trying to, you know, have fun, especially a day at the races where there's other stuff to do. And, you know, you're, you're not necessarily, you don't need to make $10,000 to have a good day. I mean, you could go enjoy the day and make a few bets and have a few drinks and have a good time. Um, betting win place for me, I, I think is, is what I do when I'm, when I'm being realistic. So. Yeah. Um, Evan, we have a question for you from oh. Travis. He says, what is the article or news clipping framed behind you? It looks very interesting. Oh, well, that is a copy of uh, Figs Form. And I don't know anybody who is old enough to remember Figs Form, but it was the uh, precursor to the racing times. Um, it was a startup publication in New York in the late 80s. Uh, Manhattan, actually, uh, it holds the distinction of the first four-color daily newspaper published in Manhattan. Um, at the time, the only other color newspaper was Newsday, which was out on Long Island. Uh, it was a, a supposed rival to the racing form that didn't last very long, but the uh, impetus behind it was Robert Sin, who had his own fix, so it was almost like a sheets type thing, but he wanted to do a newspaper, which wasn't the right move to take on the racing form. You know, if he had just kept it... Uh, it was a package of his figs. He probably would have done all right. But anyway, it's a copy of Figs form, and it's uh, Jose Santos is on the front page. Very cool. Uh, that is, uh, it's not the first one. It's, it, but it was the second one. So it's also my first byline. So. Oh, that's awesome. Anyway, save that for last, sir. Right? Yeah. <laughs> um, question. Yeah, it was a really good question. Um, yeah. Wanted to mention, uh, we were also hoping tonight uh, that Mark Cassie, who obviously has just been voted into the Hall of Fame, the National Race- Museum of Racing and Hall of Fame, uh, would join us tonight. Uh, Mark, I just looked it up, uh, has eight horses entered this weekend at Gulfstream and eight horses at Churchill. Um, I we didn't hear back from him last minute, so don't know if he'll if he'll pop up. But either way, we want to wish our uh, you know send our congratulations to Mark. Um, he's got got Stormy coming back in uh, at Gulfstream Saturday. I'm uh, so excited. Yeah, so uh, pretty cool. I mean, I was just you know just looking through his his bio, his history. I mean, you know he you know he, his, the first horse that he I mean first listed on Equibase at least that that he trained was in 1979. He was yeah he was like uh, 18 19 years old. I mean he's been uh, he's been doing, he's been doing it a long time. Well, talk about a pedigree. The Cassie family has such an amazing tradition of horsemanship. His father and now his son, Norm Cassie, you know, graded stakes winning trainer. So, you know, if you're if you're betting on pedigrees, yeah. Cassie yeah. pedigree has a lot of black type. Yeah, and, and as you guys know, you you you've talked to him a lot. I mean, he he's very personable, uh, very accessible, very uh racing friendly, uh, very opinionated. Um, just a just a real genuine human being on top of being a top-notch trainer. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, some of the big names of horses he's trained, I mean, Teppin is an amazing example. She captured the heart of a nation for her incredible, incredible campaign. You know, got Stormy, obviously, winning the, um, what was it last year? Was it the... The Four-star Dave? Four-star Dave, yeah, against Mm -hmm. the boys on, like, a five-day turnaround from her last race. It was... I just remember being there and the rafters sounded like they were going to come down at Saratoga. The crowd was going so crazy. It was so much fun. Yeah. Well, she, she didn't, she didn't run too badly in the Breeders' Cup mile either. Yeah. No, she did not. She, and she ran really huge that year in the uh, Woodbine mile as well, coming up a very, very close second. So, yeah. and then of course, War of Will, Preakness last year. That was so much fun. Speaking of the Preakness. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Evan, what what, what were your um, uh, takeaways? Because I was actually, I, what I wanted to ask Mark, um, and, and as it looks more likely that we, I won't be able to ask him, I'll just, <coughs> I'll just say what, what I had in mind was, you know, I wonder what, what the two weeks between Derby and Preakness last year, how those compared to what would have been the two weeks between Derby and Preakness this year for Mark. Uh, a lot different because obviously coming out with, you know, following all the war of Will drama out of the Kentucky Derby and then ultimately – you know, getting a little bit of validation, I guess, in the Preakness. Um, going back to last year, Evan, what, what was your take on sort of the, uh, you know, the bigger uh, controversy or controversies um, related to Derby last year? 
Oh well, it was uh, it was you, know, you kind of got whipsawed. I mean, you did you every time, even after the decision was made on the disqualification of the Derby, every time you watched it, you changed your mind. So <laughs> you can see what you know the the pressure the stewards were mm. under, um, mm. and you know the 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 effect it had on or of will and the effect it had on, uh, you know, then maximum security came all the way over to it, squeezed uh, 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 Shug's uh, coat of honor on the rail. So mm -hmm. you have to go back and watch it and watch it again. So, uh, you know, now a year later, uh, it, uh, say, I have the same opinion as I had the day after it was the right move. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it, uh, it just kind of, uh, it just kind of made kind of a weird vibe to the whole Triple Crown series last year. Yeah, and just when you think it couldn't get any weirder, now we don't even know when the Preakness is, but we're finding out on Saturday. Saturday. <clears throat> and, you know, you can, you can you can ask people, and people will tell you it's going to be uh, at the end of June. People will tell you it's going to be in October, and you know, no, nobody knows. If you were, like, the high king of horse racing, how would you – it's a real position. Um, how would you uh, do the order of the Triple Crown this year? Uh – that's a great question. I mean, it, basically, you would think, um, and just just basically again, what you hear from a lot of different people, it's all swirling rumors. But you would assume it would go Belmont, uh, Preakness, Derby. I mean, you can't really have. I mean, you you might be able to have one of the races after the Derby, but you're you're butting up against. The, I mean, the the ultimate goal or the Triple Crown races and the Breeders' Cup. Cool. So you're not going to have a whole series after. Uh, the Derby on September 5th. You, you're, you're, if you've got a the Derby winner, you want to you want to run the Breeders' Cup Classic, which is two months later. So, mm -hmm. uh, uh, in, a, in a perfect world, if I'm swirling the thing, I would have I would have the Derby be the last race. But uh, but I don't know whether New York or Maryland is going to be in a position to run. I mean, you know, you don't know. Yeah. You, um, I, I mean, as somebody who's been around uh, for, for a while and, and, and who knows really, I think, some of the considerations that would go into a decision about whether you can actually or whether you would actually run the Kentucky Derby uh, in, in, an empty, in front of an empty grandstand. Um, and also as someone who, you know, I'm sure you could also think about uh, Breeders' Cup within sort of the same context and, you know, does it work? Can it happen that way? Um, do, do you think it's possible or, or, or that, or that it could potentially even be likely with, you know, as we sort of get into, to June here, um, and think about, you know, the possibility of within two or three or four months run, you know, having a major sporting event with fans, you think it's possible that one or both of those events are run fanless? Uh, it's highly likely, uh, okay. I, you know, the, here in Kentucky, we're, we're on the edge of the edge of the South and University of Kentucky is in the SEC. I mean, the, the biggest talking points here are college football. Um, I, I don't know whether that's going to happen, even though everybody in the SEC says it's guaranteed. Now, once you get the racing, uh, obviously, obviously they can. But I mean, you know, you, we all know the Maryland Jockey Club, uh, their their year depends on Christmas weekend. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not a shareholder in Churchill Downs, but I got to imagine uh, the Derby is pretty darn important to them. Uh, mm -hmm. Not just from a race standpoint, a betting standpoint, from from hospitality, ticketing, all that stuff. Same as the Breeders' Cup. I mean, it, it's a you know, the 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 event, the fans there, uh, it, it's part of the revenue stream. Whereas the NFL, <clears throat> it's not as much. And you, you read the other day about Major League Baseball, forty percent of their money comes from from uh, ticket revenue and beer sales and all that stuff. So it, it's important to baseball, not as important to the NFL. Now, as far as racing goes, <clears throat> it's important to run a derby. Uh, I think if Churchill runs it without fans or, or the Breeders' Cup runs without fans, it's, it's, it's uh, might be, might be a, a financial loss, but I think it's the right thing to do to run. Hmm. I, and again, they, I, I don't want to be, they, they probably don't want to be the ones that, who make that determination, whether they have fans or not. Yeah. So why, you know, everybody's going to wait and see. Yeah. yeah it's, 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 and, one other might, and one other thing I might add, uh, we're, we're finding that now, you know, as, as COVID-19 runs through and the, and the government is kind of back, the federal government is kind of backed off and left it up to the states. Now everybody in the states know how racing has been run for the last hundred years with states having different rules and their own rules and regulations. Yeah. yeah. Our, 
open, Belmont can't. Churchill Downs can open. Prairie Meadows can't. Uh, isn't so. Uh, yeah, yeah it, it's not answering the question, but I. I yeah, no, yeah. it is. Yeah, totally. No, we you covered a lot there. Uh, I we were, you know, I mean, obviously we're sort of uh, obviously extremely happy to see that Santa Anita is going to be uh, reopening tomorrow as well. And you know, I didn't know. I mean, because Santa Anita, you know, uh, well, not to not to get too too down uh, a certain path, but you know, a, a lot of this, I mean, uh, depends on as you touched on. I think some of the the, the guidance that I think uh, all these all the tracks are getting from local health officials, but you know, you know, it does also come down to I think, and this might just be related. I mean, uh, it comes down to local politics as well as and state governments and and state politics, and so I, I think you know to to put it uh, you know in, in a way that's you know could not be sort of objectively criticized at all. I think I, I was. I, I was not at all positive that given, you know, the politics of, of where Santa Anita is located, uh, being California, being in L.A., you know, which is taken, which is really still largely under a lockdown. Uh, I, I was a little surprised, I, I guess, and, and pleasantly surprised that they um, that they got the green light. Uh, did you did you have the same for you? Or? Yeah, because it was like uh, yesterday we got the, or, you know, the announcement was L.A. County was, you know, Going, we're going to continue for three more months. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, talking to Tracy Gantz, who are, who's our California correspondent today, she was like, well, that, they kind of walked it back a little today. Uh, just, they were kind of saying it's not a real lockdown. You kind of can do what you're doing, uh, which, well, I mean, which is still not much. So, mm. so you had that information yesterday and then, then the news that San Diego was going to open. So you kind of, you kind of said, oh, well, San Diego is going to be closed for a while. And it's open. So there was a, Sigh of relief that they're open. Yeah, and his name is Golden Gate too. So, yeah. Um, do you? Um, you know, we talked about uh, these big racing events that are coming up and them being run fanless from a from a journalistic or from a turf rider standpoint. Um, you know, what are your plans for for covering these races? How do you cover these races? Yeah. Um, well, that's a great question. Uh, and we, we talk about that every week, and the answer is we don't know. Uh, all I can tell, we you know, we have these editorial meetings every week, and all I can say is, you know, these races are going to be run, and, and we're going to be covering them a lot differently than we've covered them in the past. Um, what that, you know, again, it depends on what's available. Let's say, uh, you know, the Preakness, you know, we usually have four or five people there. Mm -hmm. you, say, you can't have anybody or you can have one person or, uh, you know, again, you're, you're waiting to hear uh, from the Maryland Jockey Club or from Churchill Downs or from Naira uh, what you can do. So, yeah. uh, you know, right now it, it's kind of working because owners aren't there either. So you work the phones after the race. Um, yeah, I was about to say the, the numbers you have saved in one of these just become <laughs> vitally important. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and the tracks, you know, are doing great. The, you know, the photos that we got from Cody out of Oakland, you know, mm -hmm. it was so above and beyond what we would normally get uh, their coverage. And I'm, I'm assuming Cody will do the same thing at Churchill Downs. So, yeah, I mean, shout out to the racetrack photographers for sure. They've been working yeah. out over time. Yeah, so, so the press offices are going to have to work, or, you know, they work hard, but they're going to pump out more information, have more quotes available and whatnot. But yeah, but the goal is to try to get that something different from a writing standpoint. But that's what one of the blood horse's strengths is, you know, you talk to the breeder, you talk to the guy who sold the horse as a two-year-old. You have, you have to, you know, uh, go through your equine line, do a little back, do a little leg work and, and make some phone calls. So, I mean, that's what you do from a magazine standpoint. Again, from the website, you you know, the race is over, you got to get something up. So, you're, you know, we're writing the same story two or three different ways every week mm. already. So uh, it just makes it a little harder to, you, you just don't have that one-on-one -on -one contact. Okay. So uh, we have a question from Travis. It says, do you, what do you, I think, what do you see in the future, even when tracks open with limited attendance? I don't know if we've covered it that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I guess we haven't talked about that. I mean, do, do you see it being sort of a, a gradual thing where it kind of opens where tracks will allow sort of maybe like a set number of, of fans to come in or? I, I don't know. I mean, and, and, and how do you know to, I mean, to go to the track? You know, if they say, okay, we'll let three people in per section at the grandstand or something. I and mean, how do you know, how do you know you, you get in? It's kind of like, uh, 
I'm a member of the YMCA and uh, uh, work out on occasion. Yeah. Um, uh, but we got the email from them yesterday saying they're <laughs> going to be opening up in June, but it's going to be different. I mean, it, you know, there used to be 50 treadmills, so they're only going to be five because they have to put them six feet apart. And yeah, who gets in and who doesn't? So, you know, I, I, I don't think, don't think I've answered <laughs> the question, but I mean, I, I, it'll be interesting to see what they what they say at a racetrack. Hey, a hundred people can come in today, or a thousand people could come in today, but you got to spread out. I don't know whether. That value is there to be there in person. That I don't know. Right. I did see an in, an interesting thing on on Twitter. I can't remember where this casino was, but they're about to reopen a casino somewhere, and um, they put a picture up. Vanilla, did you see this? I, I tweeted this earlier. No, is it Oakland? Oakland's about to open their casino. Yeah, so they're going to reopen, but this particular photo wasn't from Oakland. But it was it was essentially them saying, "Hey, look at all the precautions we're taking. We've you know we've we're completely like innovating." And what they've done is like they've put up like those um, just basically like a clear like glass plexiglass, plexiglass yeah, between between the slot machines. But they're not. I mean, they only come about like like this high. And so, like, this is exposed, down below is exposed, and there's just, like, you know, like, ba basically, like, a, a two-foot by two-foot area on each side of the, the slot machine that um, is, uh, is, is blocked, I guess, just in case the person next to you decides to turn and sneeze on you. <laughs> well, I mean, I'd rather have that than nothing. <laughs> exactly. I also do not have any desire to go into, like, an enclosed area right now. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, we don't want to hang out in the pre in the uh, Pimlico paddock, paddock right now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's a little snuggly in there for me <laughs> for these social distancing times. Yeah. I um, I've been, but I have been looking at like pictures of where they are gradually reopening in, um, like Singapore and and South Korea and places like that, and it's like it's in it's it's intense. Yeah. Like there is a lot of plexiglass. I saw one like fancy restaurant in Paris or something was using 1940s mannequins dressed up to like <laughs> occupy. Did you see that one? Yeah, yeah. But you want to make it look full. You don't want to. Walk. Who wants? You know, who wants to eat in a, in an empty restaurant? I think I'd rather eat in an empty restaurant than next to like a quasi possessed 1940s haunted mannequin. Like I'm real. I'm not so hungry thinking about that. Like, oh my god. Um, all right. Well, Evan, I, I think, you know, you've been, you've been super generous with your time here on a Thursday night. Uh, we, you know, we'll wind down here. I want to give you an opportunity though, uh, for anybody watching or who watches this replay on our Facebook or YouTube, um, any information, uh, that they should know about blood horse subscribing, uh, where can they, where can they get blood horse? Uh, well, you can go to bloodhorse.com. I think our website's pretty strong. Um, we probably don't do a great job of selling ourselves on there, but you should be able to click on something and find some way to subscribe to the magazine. That would be most helpful. Uh, but there is lots of good information on the website. We also have the daily, Blood Horse Daily. That's free also. You can download that pretty easily. You can get on that mailing list, and you'll get a, you'll get a lovely little uh, email uh, from 9 or 10 o'clock every night with the day's news on there. But, of course, <clears throat> uh, the key thing about the magazine, excuse me, the key thing about the magazine is, is a lot of the features in there don't wind up on the website. So uh, mm. we go out of our way to make sure that if you are a paid subscriber, you're getting uh, unique content. So uh, hopefully you can uh, part with a few dollars and help support the business and help support the industry. And, uh, and we'd love to have you a subscriber. But if not, uh, bloodhorse.com is good. We pick up a few things from America's Best Daily from time to time, and, and you do the same. So. But, but there, there are two kind of different uh, subsets. We have a lot of uh, uh, data on there as well, as far as sales data. Uh, if you're interested in the sales, the two-year-old sales are coming up. We've got a couple of big two-year-old sale preview uh, type features for both the website and the daily and the magazine uh, for those sales that start uh, a couple of weeks, middle of June at OBS and then end of June at Basic Tip. And so bloodhorse.com is, is a great portal. Come on in. Thanks. There, re there really is nothing like holding the physical magazine. I mean, it, that's yeah, it is. Uh, it's very it's satisfying. It's glossy. Subscribe. Yeah. Got a copyright here again. Fonner Park. Fonner Park on the cover this week. 
That is wild. It was the first time in how long that? Um, uh, yeah, we talked about this earlier. Uh, first time since 1982. Wow. Nebraska has graced uh, the great state of Nebraska has graced the cover of the blood horse. So. All right, Nebraskans, you know what to do. Get subscribing. <laughs> we're, we're, we're picking Lincoln. That's worth, yeah, exactly. That's worth, that's worth for anything. All right, Evan, thank you again for your time. Uh, next week, we'll be back Thursday Night Live, same time, Facebook and YouTube. Uh, next week, uh, another exciting uh, couple of guests, um, Amplify Racing. Um, Evan, I don't know if you've heard of them. Young, uh, two young women who have decided to basically create this big resource. Um, if you're interested in learning more about horse racing, if you're a younger person who wants to start a career in racing, they started a web website, amplifyracing.org. Um, we're going to talk to them about what made them start it and uh, what you can, uh, you know, how you can get started in a career in horse racing. And so they're uh, they're doing some really good stuff. Looking forward to that next week, Penelope. I'll see you before then, right? Tuesday, five and five. Five and five on Tuesday every week. Whether you guys like it or not. Um, <laughs> hey, we, Evan, for you, we have one more question, which is, are you on social media? Do you have a Twitter account, a Facebook, an Instagram? Are you on TikTok, Evan? I am not, but my uh, <laughs> college age daughter is. <laughs> I have actually two Twitter handles. It's uh, BH uh, underscore E Hammonds. And if you want to find something uh, it's not necessarily racing related. You can go to Black Cat 30. Very right. cool. So you have like a personal and a professional. Correct. But I mean, it's the Black Cat 30 is a lot of horse related stuff, but you'll find some music stuff there. Uh, Ooh, who are you listening to? <clears throat> well, uh, my main man, Jason Isbell, has got an album that comes out tomorrow. Uh, he's kind of big around here. Uh, anybody who's anybody in Kentucky is a Tyler Childers fan. So. Uh, that I'm kind of that's my uh, bent these days. So it's a little more Americana uh, based than uh, uh, anything else. I'll tell you what, though, Black Cat Thirty does sound like what the kids call these days a, a burner account. Well, uh, <laughs> I don't think I'm burning anything off. <laughs> no. That's so well, funny. I, I, I can see my number skyrocketing. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> follow, follow, follow. All right, Evan, thank you so much. Penelope, enjoy the rest of your night. Thank you. You too. All right, we'll see you all soon.